I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm also very aware of the time of day, so I'm going to try and keep it light, uh, introduce some ideas, and then if you find them interesting, you can do the groundwork later. Um, and so my talk today, it's going to be a little bit of a shift from what we've been hearing about. Um, it's a Python package called PyFi, um, and it's a toolbox for integrated information. So as a first thing, I want to acknowledge um, I don't do most of the coding for the package. Um, the work is done by Will Maynard, who is a now a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He was what we would have called a few talks ago a kind of software research software engineer, and then he made the um, regrettable decision to go into the poor paying academic life instead of uh, continuing his, uh, acad his software engineering uh, pursuits. But you can find his all oh, the code is on his GitHub, and that's where the package is kept and maintained. Um, and so the way I want to do this is I'm going to start by, because I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the idea of integrated information. So I'm going to try and lay some groundwork, some groundwork in statistics and data science for us. Um, so I'm starting with something that hopefully everyone has heard of, uh, Bayesian networks or causal networks, which are essentially um, conditional probabilities, right? The, you have some variables and this, this, I peeled this one off Wikipedia, you've got sprinkler, you've got rain, you've got grass, and you want to know whether the sprinkler is on or off, conditional on whether it's raining or not, whether the grass is wet, conditional on whether the sprinkler is on or the sprinkler is off. And so you learn um, using, you, know, you collect data, you learn the conditional probabilities, and then from the conditional probabilities, you can draw this kind of network structure. Um, there is a, some symmetries in the network structure, of course. Um, if there's a relationship between uh, rain and grass wet. The rain makes the grass wet. We know that. The grass being wet does not make it rain. That's kind of trivial in this case, not always the case. So the, the term causal network is introduced to, um, to say we kind of know, when we call it a causal network, so we know the direction of the arrows properly. Whereas Bayesian network, I think there's a little bit of understanding that maybe it's not quite certain in the direction of the arrows. But either way, we get this um, graphical, like graph theory kind of model network structure um, that is largely based on conditional probabilities. And um, this is just to show that this has been kind of increasing in popularity over the years. I did a, some Google Scholar search results. And you know, from 2000 to 2010, we had about half a million hits for causal networks and Bayesian networks. And then from 2010 to 2020, it's up to 1.5 million. So the publication rate is about tripled in that time. And you know there are lots of people doing great work in this field. I put Judea Pearl's book up here because that's my first exposure to these networks. And he is a pioneer of causal networks. So if you wanna get into it, you can read his really comprehensive and uh, difficult to read book to, as, an, as an introduction. And so integrated information, I'm gonna use causal networks as kind of like the underlying idea. Um, quickly, you know, what kind of things can we do with these Bayesian networks, causal networks? Um, I stole this from uh, the University of Toronto who graciously uh, put it on their webpage for me to put here. So social networks are an idea of a Bayesian network. You've got a bunch of people and you wanna know um, who is connected to who or if you're interested in marketing, who influences who? And you want to understand the, influ the influence graph. And that's one kind of obvious application of our modern world. Another one is uh, functional brain networks. Um, and this actually, I was thinking about this slide in the last talk, fMRI is a great example of spatial temporal data. The brain is stationary, you've got fixed spatial voxels, and then you have a time series of bold activation. So fMRI is a, a kind of a great example of the previous talk and something that would be good for Kubel. But brain networks are another form of um, uh, network analysis where we want to know which brain regions are interacting, uh, maybe depending on what kind of task is being done, we want to know how is the brain accomplishing whatever it's doing. So this is another, just an example of uh, a Bayesian network or causal networks in action. And there are many more. I don't need to go through them, but those are kind of the two that are most impactful to me, but like transportation networks and in ecology, you have kind of animal migration networks, 
actual computer networks where the term comes from can be modeled like this. So the, it, there are tons and tons of applications to these networks. Okay, so that's my, that's my introduction. Now let's slow down. What am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about integrated information. And contrary to what you might think, there are, well, there are tons of packages out there to do inference of networks. Get a bunch of data. How do I learn the network? I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm going to take the position of you've already done that. You've used one of some of these other great packages, and now you've got a Bayesian network or a causal network. And what I'm going to do is, you well, know, how can we tease some information out of this? How can we tease some interesting facts about the network? What do we do with the network once we've got it? And I'm going to introduce the notion of integrated information first, and then the package for computing integrated information. And I'm going to run through kind of a, uh, a toy example, not a toy example, it's a real example, but it has nothing to do with most of my research, it's just something that I kind of did on the side that I thought was pretty fun. Okay, so integrated information, we'll start with information. I think that's apt here. So information theory, we're talking about uh, communication across a channel, generally. You got two people, two cups, a string, and you want to know if I know what the person on one side said, um, what will the person on the other side know? How much information is being um, passed through this channel? And information theory is wildly successful as a, an idea, it has entire departments named after it. Um, and one of the kind of uh, fundamental quantities you get out of information theory is mutual information. And you have two random variables, X and Y, and you ask how much information does X contain about Y? That is, I, I start off kind of uncertain about Y, I learn X, I reduce that uncertainty, and that reduction in uncertainty is the information X has about Y. And that's gonna be the basis for my jump to integrated information. So <clears throat> now question is, I've got this Bayesian network, I've got this notion of information, how can I use information to study my network? What can I, what can it tell me about my network? Well, a natural thing that you might try is to say, well, how much information does the current state of the network have about the next state of the network? Another way you could phrase that is how well can I predict the future of the network based on the current state of the network? Basically using information theory to to learn how much does the network kind of define what it does in the future versus how much comes from noise or external influence or whatever else. And so you could define the current state of the network, the future state, and take the mutual information, and then you get a value. And that works. And here's my problem. It's not a big problem, but let's say I'm interested in this, then it becomes a problem. Is this approach of mutual information doesn't distinguish between these two very simple network diagrams where in both cases, let's say I can perfectly predict um, the future state of A and the future state of B. There's two bits of information in both networks. I mean, I have to define the probabilities and such, but it can be done. Um, but the point is in both cases, you know, A and B tell you about A and B in the future. And mutual information doesn't tell you, you know, just um, kind of naively applied, let's say, doesn't tell you anything about the fact that in one case, a is isolated from B, and in the other case, the two are interacting. And that's where the idea of integrated information comes in, where you know, I'd like to say that the first system is not integrated, but the second system is. So how do I capture integrated information? Well, the idea is we try cutting the system using our kind of information theoretic scissors. And you cut the system, the system is changed or not in some way, and you measure this change. You measure how much is lost by cutting the system. In the first case, I cut between A and B, nothing happens, I lose nothing. It reveals to me that the system is not integrated. In the second case, I cut, the two connections are severed. I leave it kind of vague for now what that means to sever the connections, but you have to operationalize that. But of course, now I change somehow fundamentally the network, and when I look at the information loss, I see that I did lose something. Cutting the system apart did something, it was integrated. That's a kind of a nice starting idea. Then, um, and for if there's just A and B, it's kind of simple, but now I have A, B, C, and D. 
And I have many ways I could potentially cut the system. I have three here. If I cut, so I've got A, B, C, D, and these kind of two modules, A and B are integrated, C and D are integrated, but the two modules are not. And if I cut from A to B, C, D, I'm going to lose something, information loss. If I cut D away, I'm going to lose something. But if I choose to cut between A, B, and C, D, then I'll lose nothing. So which way to cut the system? This way, obviously, the system's not integrated. The answer has to be that it has no integrated information. And so the solution to this problem is to try everything, basically. Try all possible cuts and find the one that minimizes the loss of information, the minimum information partition, or the kind of so-called weakest link of the system. And so by doing this, now you are essentially trying to quantify how much information is going across the weakest link of the system. If the system is actually two separate systems, the answer will be zero. And then the stronger and more heavily interacting the system is, the higher the integrated information will be. So here's this general framework for integrated information. You start with a Bayesian network or causal network. I'll call it just a transition probability matrix because everything's discrete here. You apply a minimum partition, call it theta, to cut the matrix. And you get some cut transition probability matrix, T theta. And then you need some distance measure between the two. So this is a general framework. And in fact, there have been many proposals for different ways to operationalize each of these parts. How do I cut it? What does cutting do to the TPM? What's the right distance measure between a cut and uncut TPM? Is it you know, probability of future state, probability of past state? Is it does what one part says about the other, or is it about the holes or the parts? There's, there's all kinds. And there's one paper here, actually, um, this one by uh, Max Tegmark, where he kind of does a, a taxonomy of these things and kind of outlines these are the three major decisions that need to be made. And here's all of the possible things I can think of. So here's, you know, like a, a metaverse of possible uh, integrated information values, and here's how they all behave. And these ones are silly because they give bad answers so we rule them out and so on so there's lots of them um, i bolded one here the one by um mazuhumi uh, this one is the one that's the default option for the software i'm using and it's the one that i'll use throughout here i will mention that um, this notion of integrated information is based in a theory of consciousness where the idea is how does the brain support consciousness well one kind of requirement for being conscious is that you are integrating information would have to have a whole nother talk to really talk about the theory so i just won't but that's kind of where it comes from as a kind of a history here okay so that's integrated information this general concept of i want to use information theory to study bayesian networks and i want to know how um, tightly interacting they are. How much does it kind of hold together as one system versus uh, is it easily separable into two systems? Another way to say it is, is the system uh, reducible? Can I, can I cut it into two with no loss or is it irreducible? Any way of cutting it will require me to lose something. And there's many ways you could implement this general idea and this uh, software, PyFi, the Python package, um, implements a few different ways of doing it. Not just the one I highlighted, but it has different config options. You can swap out distance functions, swap out definitions of cutting, all kinds of different um, ways you can modify it. I basically already said all this. So PyFi is a, a library for computing integrated information. Um, there's a paper about it if you want to look that up. And so how does it work? I'm going to be very sparse on this kind of detail, but essentially the input to the PyFi algorithm is a transition probability matrix. So you define a transition probability matrix as a NumPy array. It's in this, what I call state by node form, um, where you just do the probabilities for each node independently. So given a state, it's probability of kind of a, probability of B, probability of C being on or off. So this is kind of just a simple binary graph and has this compact form of the TPM. You can put in a connectivity matrix, the arrows on the graph, 
but that's actually not necessary. It can just speed up some computations. And then you define a network, you can give it some labels. Then one of the key ideas here is I may not want to compute the integrated information of the whole network, but actually some subsystem, some subset of network elements. Because if you think about how you would expect integrated information to behave, right. scoop back to this example, if I look at A, B, C, D as a system, I'm going to find it's not integrated. But if I look at A, B, I will find it is integrated. Or if I look at C, D, I will find it is integrated. So I don't just want to look at the whole thing, but I actually may want to find kind of integrated subparts of the system. So you start with your kind of your network, which is everything you're putting in. And now you're going to look at subsystems one at a time. This particular version of integrated information is state dependent. So you give it a state as well. And then you perform what's called the irreducibility analysis. Just compute the irreducibility of subsystem. It'll output the phi value, capital phi for integrated information. Um, and it'll also tell you the minimum information partition. How did it cut the system? It tried all possible ways of cutting. How did it cut the system in order to minimize the information loss? In this case, it cut C away from A and B. Okay, so now here's my fun example that I like, and it's a biology example. It's the fission yeast cell cycle. And this is a Boolean network model of um, cellular mitosis, cell division in the fission yeast cell. Some biologists made this model and it's done by rigorous experiment where they, um, you know, they're um, kind of doing a causal analysis where they control protein expression and look how different types of protein expression affect other kinds of protein expression. So what we have here are nine nodes, um, but this one here, SK on the left, it's the catalyst. It's kind of what fires up cell division. It just comes in and stops. But these eight um, nodes, each one represents protein expression. Is it expressing or not expressing? And the whole cell cycle goes like this. You, you inject some of SK, so SK protein expresses, and then it runs through a sequence of nine steps and it comes back to its steady state at the end. And once it's gone through the cycle, it the cell has divided. And I was interested in studying the integrated information of this um, biological system um, as a way to try and um, look into ideas of like autonomy and kind of self-sustainability. So I mean, the network itself, I convert this into a transition probability matrix. I put it into PyFi, I run it. It's kind of nothing much to be said there about how it's done. But what you find is the system of eight proteins that are expressed is an integrated system. And it's integrated with some, you know, phi equals 0.4 value. And you might wonder, well, is that interesting or not interesting? Does it matter at all? That's, I think, an important question. And so to try and show that it mattered, I looked at some of the other things people had done with this particular model. And one thing that somebody had done is define what's called the functional backbone of the model. So what they do is they take this model and they start removing connections one at a time. And they remove as many connections as possible while leaving the sequence of cell division intact. So this model is functionally equivalent to the one that I analyzed. But now when I run it through, I find that the eight nodes are not integrated. In fact, the largest integrated system is a subset of six nodes, and they're integrated with a much lower integrated information value. So taking away these seemingly functionally innocuous connections has greatly impacted the um, integrated information of the system. Well, what does that I mean, what were those functions doing? Why do the, are those connections there biologically? And we kind of know, you know, nature doesn't do things if it doesn't have a reason to do them. And it turns out, and I'll kind of make this point later, for now I'm just gonna tell you rather than show you, that a lot of these connections are kind of fail safes and redundancies. If the system gets knocked out of its cycle, they will bring it back into the cycle. They keep it in line, it's a, that's a fail safe mechanism. So while this integrated system will do cell division, and this not integrated system will do cell division. This one is much more robust to you know, 
life. So that was kind of an interesting idea that uh, being an integrated system seemed to be kind of initially um, related to your kind of ability to survive under different conditions, let's say. So another part of autonomy that I wanted to look into was how, how does a system distinguish itself from its environment? And integrated information provides an interesting way to do this by looking at subsets and looking where do we find maxima? Because if you imagine how does it behave? Well, you start with one node and it's got some information and it's kind of all integrated because there's only one thing. Then you add a second node and you get more information, right? In a like mutual information sense, you have more nodes, you have more information. You don't lose information by adding things to the system. So you're always adding information by adding more nodes. And as long as those nodes are strongly connected, you're going to add integrated information. But if you add a weak link, it's going to, integrated information is going to plummet. And so by looking for kind of local maxima, you take, you start with a seed and you build it out to kind of the most integrated it could be such that adding anything else to it would make it kind of less of an integrated thing, an integrated entity, if you want to kind of take my biological perspective. And so um, looking for these local maxima, I was thinking of as a way to kind of say, does the system divide itself from its environment? Or are there kind of modules within the system that are kind of tightly integrated with themselves that are somehow interesting in how they divide themselves from the system? So we run that for the cell cycle. We find that the cell cycle is a local maximum. So it does, I mean, it divides itself from the catalyst. It's not that interesting. It's more that any of the seven node systems are less integrated than it. So it does grow all the way to its full system if you're looking for a maxima. And we also found some additional kind of modules of high integration. And the one I wanna focus specifically on is this set of three here, the RUM1, SDE9, and CDC213. And they um, stand out as this kind of module of that are more integrated with themselves than they are with the rest of the system um, and, it kind of, it, and it kind of elevates them as like highlights them. And I was saying, okay, are these things doing anything interesting? And so that brings me to the next way that I want to use integrated information as an idea. And that's to kind of understand what the system is doing. And um, I use the term mechanism. I say I, we as a, like a general community. Um, a mechanism to reference, you know, a set of elements that do something together for the system. So if you're trying to understand the system, um, we already have this kind of holistic view that you get from mutual information or integrated information to say, how does the system predict its future state? Or how does it do it as a whole that's irreducible? Um, but that just tells you kind of what the next state is going to be. It doesn't tell you how or why it gets there. And you can also take this kind of reductionist approach and look at every element one at a time and say, okay, what does what does RUM1 do? What does CDC25 do? What does SLP1 do? You could take each one of them and kind of completely define what they do. Um, but what I found in this case, or in as a general way to do things, is when you're trying to learn about what a system is doing, sometimes you don't want to go holistic or reductionist, but you want to see the middle ground. But of course, the middle ground is huge. People don't do it because it's massive. There's so many things you can do. So we say, well, when do I want to say that two units are kind of worth studying together as a pair rather than separately? And the answer that I'm proposing is, well, if they integrate information, if they do something together, that's more than the sum of their parts. So just, again, I'm not going to give the technical details here, but a couple of examples just to make the point. So B does something to A. Knowing B is on tells me that A is going to be on. It's a copy gate, computer science lingo. That's clear. I've learned something that the system does. And then here, now I have B and C as two inputs to A, and A implements AND logic. So in order for A to turn on, both B and C must be on. And so B and C together do something. They tell me what the future state of A is going to be. If I cut the system in any way, if I if I sever any of these connections, I will lose information about the state of A. Only by knowing both B and C do I learn that they turn A on. 
And so I would say B and C together form a mechanism in the system, you know, a pair of units that does something. And as by contrast, here I have two copy gates, A copies B, C copies D. Together they do nothing. I can cut across down the middle, I lose nothing, there's no integrated information. So I said B and D is not a mechanism in the system. It just, B does something, D does something, together they do nothing, so I don't consider it anymore. And in doing so, I can find kind of subsets in the system that do things for the system. So the PyFi software will run this idea of what we call a cause effect structure. So, you know, mechanisms that have effects in the system or have causes in the system, you say kind of where they're going or where they came from. And so you can use the software to generate the cause effect structure and it'll tell you, okay, here's A and here's what A does, here's B, here's what B does. A, B together do something, B, C together do something, but A, C is not here, it's reducible. It doesn't do anything for the system. And in that way, I can pick out a bunch of mechanisms and explore what are they doing for the system? And maybe that'll help tie my story together. Hopefully I'm going somewhere. Um, I ran it on the fission yeast cell cycle. I, this is actually not very important, so I'm gonna skip it. It has a bunch of mechanisms, it's not important. There's one particular one that I wanna talk about actually. But before I do, I again went back to what other people have done with the um, fission yeast cell cycle. And somebody, well, Kim, 2013, uh, did this analysis where they tried to find um, what's called the attractor basin. So they want to say, if I, as a scientist, go in and I um, intervene on the system, I set it into a particular state and hold it there. So I fix, so I, I go in and I fix these nodes into a state. And then I let, I take everything I'm not fixing and set it into all possible states. And they're asking which one of these, you know, for every possible state, the other nodes are in the ones you're not controlling. Does the system make it into its cells division? Does it, does it find a way back into the cell cycle and reach its steady state attractor? And what they found was they found a set of a control kernel, the minimum set of nodes, such that if you hold these four, these four, which in my pictures are the green ones, if you set the green ones into a particular state, that's the minimum set of things you can do to ensure the system will go and do cell division, no matter what happens to the rest. And so what I did is I went and I looked at the mechanisms and I found that there is a mechanism in the system that is a set of units, CDC 213, SDE9 and RUM1, which together are irreducible. They do something together for the system. And what they do, if I look at the, what I call the effect repertoire, the probability they set the system into, is they do exactly um, setting this control kernel into the state it needs to be in to ensure the system goes through cell division. So I found a set of units which together do something greater than the sum of their parts. And what they do is for the system itself, kind of intrinsically, so to say, do exactly what the scientists figured out extrinsically needs to be done to ensure cell division. So the scientists found that by manipulating these nodes, I can ensure cell division. And it turns out that this integrated system has a mechanism itself to kind of put itself into the state it needs to be in. And in fact, these, the mechanism that does it, CDC23, ST9, and ROM1, is exactly this set here that was a local maximum of integrated information earlier. So does this all, you know, it, it's very kind of a provocative story to say that there's some interesting ideas about how the cell cycle is integrated and what this integration buys it in terms of robustness and how I can use the integration to identify how it's able to kind of self-sustain itself in its environment. And that's that's why I kind of wrote about autonomy, you know, this system which um, forms a boundary from its environment and has mechanisms to sustain itself. Very interesting in, you know, if you think about autonomy and life and um, these kinds of things. And so, yeah, that's, that's the end of what I want to talk about. Quick summary, integrated information quantifies the degree of interactions within a network, how tightly it kind of hangs together. Um, you can think of it kind of as a measure of complexity, right? You need complex, you need complex interactions and high information in order to have integrated information. And we have this PyFi package, which can be used to compute integrated information. 
to identify local maxima and to find integrated mechanisms and find the structure of the system. And that's it. And thank you for listening.